The Eastgow is a 100-year-old design that has evolved into one of the fastest boats on the water. Each year, the top finishers qualify to race in the blue chip. This year, there's a special feature. The best sailors ever collected for one regatta. The old big guns getting together and duking it out with each other. That's an incredible event. Olympic people, America's Cup people. Everyone's here. How could you miss this? The Blue Chip invites one mystery guest outside the class to compete. 2015 is the 50th anniversary, and 24 past mystery guests are here. Welcome to the return of the legend. ESPN Classic presents the 50th running of the Blue Chip. 90 miles northwest of Chicago, Keewaukee Lake, formed during the Ice Age, is home to a vibrant sailing community. The crews prepare their boats for the first of five races on a light wind morning. The Pewaukee Yacht Club gets a lot of credit bringing so many great sailors around North America to this tiny lake. But let there be no doubt, this group of sailors is very competitive. Guest crews, borrowed boat, how are these sailors going to react? Well, that's what we're going to find okay. out. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Jib down, jib in. At the start of race one, we're on board with five-time Rolex Yacht Swimmer of the Year, Betsy Allison, as she and her crew work to get a clean start. We're also on board with this year's collegiate national champion from Yale, Graham Landy and his crew. With 24 boats maneuvering for a favorable position, it's hard to find a fast lane and hit the line with full speed. The wind is light. Yet the East Gows take off with impressive speed. Several boats are late for the line and maneuver to find clear wind. Speaking of the wind, lakes like Pewaukee are notorious for rapidly shifting winds and random puffs with more velocity. The mystery guests are on a steep learning curve trying to figure out how to gain an advantage. Olympian Terry Nielsen, like all mystery guests, has a wealth of experience. 1984, so started training in the Finn 1982, sailed for a couple years, pretty much every day. Uh, now they sail for five years, I think, for an Olympic program, but so back then I was lucky it was two years. And, you know, it was uh, ups and downs like any program, train hard. Uh, I was fortunate to have some good training partners, uh, Russell Coots, I sailed with him a bunch, and, uh, you know, we, we all know how well he's done, so I, I was fortunate to uh, sail with some of the best. The race course is a windward lured configuration. The race committee has the option of running three to eight legs depending on the strength of the wind. The races take about one hour. M35, see him? Do we go back? I know, do you want to go back left? That's my question. Wind is better left? Ready about? Two, one, tapping. Sail number M35 on the right, skipper by world champion Cam Lewis, fights to avoid falling into Betsy Allison's disturbed wind from boat W41 on the left. Betsy Allison works hard to trim the main. She, like all the mystery guests, is glad to be here. And to have the opportunity to sail against some of the old legends and people that sailed in the first blue chips, and I guess I was smack in the middle of the group, and against a lot of the up-and-coming uh, mystery guests, pretty impressive. Did you sail scows growing up? Uh, I sailed some M16 scows growing up, but I really didn't sail e-scows at all, so this really is my second venture into the world of e-scows. I was a mystery guest back in 1999, and that was the first time I'd ever really sailed on an e scout, even though I watched them on Barnegat Bay for a number of years. And uh, being back this time with the changes, with the asymmetricals and the bigger rudders, it's really such a treat. M42 is skippered by New Jersey sailor Peter Fautenbaugh, who's one of a handful of honorary class legends also invited to the blue chip. He steers carefully to work his way past several right-of-way boats. Just ahead of him is former America's Cup helmsman Terry Nielsen. It was a good boat. I mean, I think we're the only, the the only team with a boat from 1983 that was, you know, sort of uh, souped up for the America's Cup. But it was a good boat. We had good days, bad days. I think that just it's a long, grueling campaign. You've done them, so you know what it's like. So yeah, to stay focused for that long, it's a challenge. Right now, the challenge is to stay focused as the fleet rounds the first turning mark. The scows are spread out but one gust allows these boats to accelerate and make up a lot of distance. From the air, the wind looks pretty spotty. The view from the water is a little different. What's up? Yeah, I got him. Just gonna spin it right into attack behind him. Coming up now. Graham Landy is in the middle of the fleet. He's new to the scow class and is used to racing smaller boats. 
He's also glad to be here racing against so many legends in the sport. I got the invite at the beginning of the summer and I really didn't know too much about the event. I saw a little bit of press that came off it last year, but I reached out to Steve Benjamin, who I guess was pretty familiar with the event and someone that I know quite well, and he told me a little bit about it and that it was something that would be hard to pass up for someone in my shoes, so kind of just said I'd do it. Glad you can, I think you can hoist, huh? Betsy Allison's crew sets a large asymmetrical spinnaker as she tries to figure out how to catch up. Stay high lane? Is that what you're, I can't see the boat to lure it. Oh, she jibes, she jibes, okay. So let's sail our angle. All right, I'm gonna go sit to leeward. Sorry, that's my bad. The breeze gets lighter as the fleet looks for some wind along the north shore of the lake. To gain speed, the sailors heel the boat over to reduce the surface of the hole on the water. John Lovell, flying the red spinnaker, won a silver medal at the 2004 Olympics in a multi-hole and is comfortable racing a scow. There, there's a lot of similarities, uh, especially downwind. Um, two rudders, two centerboards that they sail heeled over, so uh, the angles are pretty similar. And they go fast. Yeah, and very fast. At the end of leg two, Lovell and boat V37 leads as the crew takes down the spinnaker. Lovell was a Mr. Guest a few weeks after winning his medal in 2004. He's an accountant and one of the few mystery guests who is not a professional sailor. Peter Holmberg uses his body weight to work the boat through the waves. I think we're probably looking into a jod soon. Let this pressure set up a little longer. Landy and his crew shift the spinnaker to the other side of the boat to take advantage of the new wind. Now a graduate, he feels good about his college team's dominance over the past two years. You know, I think we had a good group of people that were motivated on the water, but also you know, when you take a step back, we gelled really well as a team and everyone had a blast doing it. And I think as soon as you get off that balance, you know, of having fun and sailing well, it's really hard to get back on. Landy sailing boat H7 rounds the gate. Nielsen is finding the scow to be a little tight for his tall body. He has a lot of respect for the high skill level of the sailors from these inland lakes. I think most people in North America don't understand how good the sailors here are, the scow sailors. They're, they're just incredible. So you've had quite a career from small boats to big boats, and uh, as you look back on your long career, what are some of the major highlights for you? I think, you know, dinghy sailing was the highlight. You know, lasers, fins was, uh, I think, the camaraderie between single-handed sailors. You can't beat that. Later on, did the America's Cup 12 meter. That was good fun, but you can't beat dinghy sailing. It's, it's the best. I think people here would agree that one design small boat sailing brings out the best in everyone. Another Olympic medalist, Peter Holmberg from the U.S. Virgin Islands, spent some time racing the scow with legendary Buddy Melgas and was encouraged to give the blue chip a try. When Buddy Melgis was my tactician 20 years ago, he said to promise him one thing. He says, Peter, before you die, you got to come to the Great Lakes and sail the scow. And when Buddy tells you that, you know he's not kidding. So when I got the invite eight years ago, I came here for a blue chip, and I just had the best time. It was fantastic. You know, No pressure. Saw a form of sailing I've never seen. Learned a ton. And I would say the, uh, the people here make it as well. So when this one came around, it was a no-brainer. Yep. Absolutely. There we go. And Betsy Allison serves as head coach of America's Paralympic team. Her sailors have won several medals on her watch. She looks ahead to the Paralympic Games in Brazil next summer. We've got uh, D. Smith, who's come from offshore sailing, who is really quite a medical contender in the 2.4, uh, following in local Johnny Roof's footsteps here. And we've got two really strong sonar teams that are, are, are vying for the spot to go to Rio. And I think we have an outside chance in the scud as well. So you never know. It'd be nice to have a, a, you know, a hat trick of three medals. There are three classes of boats raced in the Paralympic Games. Peter Holmberg and boat M10 wins race one. His time racing with Buddy Melgiz is clearly helpful. For Graham Landy, a 13th out of 24 boats is acceptable for a first time in a scow. He'll work on ways to improve in between races. There are many scow champions watching who are ready with some ideas. One race down and four to go. The wind is forecasted to build. The competition will surely get tighter. Can Holberg keep winning?
The Blue Chip Regatta was established to promote great sailing on Pewaukee Lake and attract the top scalers to travel to this remote place. The event has thrived ever since. It was really uh, three East Coast sailors, and they had gone to the Sea Blue Chip, which was down in Pestaki, 50 miles south of here, and decided, well, why don't we do this for the East Coast? And uh, that was back in 65, they had this discussion, and in 66, they formed the first uh, chip, and um, they ran it, Lowy Sawyer ran it first, um, and for a couple of years, and then our buddy Coleman took over, and he kind of helped create the mystique. The club's members volunteer to make the world's top sailors feel at home at their beloved club. Mystery guests have included superstars like Dennis Connor, Lowell North, Ken Reed, and Russell Coots. I think the second year said, let's invite some hotshot Olympic guy, and he showed up, and. Pretty soon they all wanted to come here and we just select who, who's really great this year. And we've been able to get Olympic people, America's Cup people, Starboat World Champions. I think Dennis Connors won this once. He was annoyed at losing it, came back, got Buddy Melgus to crew for him back in the mid-70s when Buddy was still a pretty good crew and won it. And then I think the only other per, uh, mystery guest to win it I think it was Andrew Campbell two years ago, maybe. So mystery guests have a hard time showing up racing uh, against all of us East Coast sailors. We're, we, we know how to make these boats go. Cam Lewis has won five world championships in three classes, plus the America's Cup. Women's match race champion Liz Bayless works to get a fast start. Recruiting these top-notch sailors to travel to Pewaukee takes some creative thinking on the part of the race organizers. Sailboat equipment manufacturer Peter Harkin says that being here is an honor. In my uh, emails and text to him, like I says, oh, you guys, you don't think uh, you're not willing to sail against these guys, huh? And so on, and uh, I did it to Jimmy Spithill, and I told him uh, that Australia, when I announced this to Australia that he's not coming, I said, hey, you know, he's going to be persona non grata in his own country and and uh, things like that. So I get a little, and then when I uh, when they start thinking about it, you know, and they start getting fearful of what maybe what's going to happen to their reputation, and they decide to come. <laughs> Cam Lewis was a mystery guest just two years ago, and has a good understanding of what it takes to win. To win here, you have to have your A game, and this is luck of the draw. I mean, it's, who knows? I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to win, but I'm going to have a good time, and I'm going to do as best I can. Well said. The breeze fills in for the second race as Dave Ullman on the right and Liz Bayless on the left duel for an advantage. The crew hike their bodies over the side to give the scow stability. BH8 is skipper by Bora Galari, who's a two-time Moth World champ. His crew is from Barnica Bay, New Jersey, and are sailing in the lead of the third leg of the course. Peter Holmberg and M10 works to pass Peter Fortenbaugh and M42. Liz Bayless tacks to find better wind near the shore. She's currently the executive director of the Women's International Match Race Association. She works the sails to keep the boat level as the gusts hit the boat. Uh, it's an incredible event and so much fun. I can't believe that they were able to put together everybody coming this year and making it happen. I had such a good time in 2009. Apparently there's lots of stories told about it, but uh, definitely when Jimmy called and asked if I'd come back, I said definitely do it. H7, Graham Landy on the left, duels against Dave Chapin on the right aboard TO33. Well, it's just an honor to be invited to, uh, to come here and race with all these uh, world champions, America's Cup sailors and just to be involved with, uh, with some of my old friends from the old Olympic uh, campaigns and the college sailing years. Maybe you and Komet are one of the few amateurs in this regatta. Is it intimidating at all racing against pros? Well, it is in a sense that they're sailing full time and we have normal careers, but these are also guys that we used to race against when we were uh, in college and uh, Olympic campaigns, so we're comfortable racing them one-on-one -on -one in a one-design fleet. One of the great things about the sport of sailing is how competitive the races are in the water, and yet how strong the bonds are between sailors on land. Everyone enjoys lifelong friendships. The fleet of East Gows cross in the windward leg approaching the first turning mark. 
Pewaukee member and scow sailor Jim Campbell was in charge of bringing all the sailors to Wisconsin. You know, the biggest uncontrollable to me with a regatta is the weather. And I think the weather's been a near 10 to be in Pewaukee, Wisconsin, late September, have the weather in the 70s, sunny and beautiful breeze. So the amount of people, we actually have more volunteers involved in this event than competitors easily. And one of our commitments has been, let's show them Pewaukee's best. I would add that the sailors are showing Pewaukee their best as well. The e-scow is a tricky boat to sail. The top skippers spend years learning the feel of these long flat holes. Getting the optimum angle of heel is critical in attaining the fastest speed. The crew and the skipper use their weight placement and sail trim to get the most efficient angle while working with the helmsman. In windy conditions, the e-scow can be a handful for even the most experienced crews. A capsize! When a boat rolls over on its side, the crew has a few seconds to right it before it turns upside down. This happens when a crew gets out of sync with the wind and with each other. The rest of the fleet stretches out on the downwind legs. East Gows can easily attain speeds over 25 miles per hour. Laura Galaria is sailing with the perfect heel angle. Okay, Jenny, good job. Three, two, one, Jenny. Cam Lewis has had an amazing career in a wide variety of boats. Uh, Finn Gold Cups was pretty cool because of uh, kind of a raucous uh, upbringing and, and, and such and uh, being independent and learning how to be good by myself and then uh, certainly the 505s after that, America's Cup and that's probably more than you asked for Gary but certainly sailing around the world in less than 80 days that was that was pretty epic. Paul Van Cleve won a world championship in the Olympic Finn class and was an All-American at the U.S. Naval Academy in the 1970s. He gives a lot of credit to his coach. We had a great coach, your friend and mine, Graham, and he taught us how to sail boats well and that short little small boat tight racing and knowing the rules and all that fun stuff. But uh, the fin was just a boat kind of built for me. Short legs and big torso, and uh, you don't drag in the water when you're hiking out. It's, it was a nice boat for me. I, lasers I was always uh, a little big for. You know, I'd be losing weight for the nationals. <laughs> but. Uh, as long as it was long course, it was okay. The short, one, or the short ones were okay. The long ones, hard to beat those th little skinny guys. It's hard to beat Bora Galari, who makes a perfectly executed turn around the mark. His veteran crew is an asset. Bora has a reputation of meticulous preparation. He's recently decided to try for an Olympic berth in the multi-hole NACRA 17 for Rio. Liz Bayless is a longtime leader in women's sailing. Women getting involved in sailing and everything that's going on, I think a lot of it has to do with how we were brought up. Uh, probably the generation I came up in, my parents didn't treat us any differently than my brothers or me. Uh, we got to go sailing and we all went sailing equally. Uh, if you said, I made a deal, I told somebody I was going to go sailing with them, that I made a commitment, that's like a job. Uh, you made a commitment to go sailing with somebody, even if it was just on a Friday night race. Uh, you got to go sailing, and it didn't matter if it was my brothers or me, we were all treated equally. Another capsized out on the course. This crew looks perplexed. Eventually a rescue boat will help them fix up the mess. BH-8, steered by Bora Galari, continues to lead the second race. They're the fastest boat out here on the downwind leg. And they cross the line for a decisive victory. Crew Henry Coley, Carl Horrocks, and Ryan Bailey exchange high fives. John Lovell crosses in second place. Bad. Bad in the middle of the pack, in 11th, okay. is Cam Lewis. Liz Bayless gets a 19th. John Lovell has a one point lead over Peter Holmberg. Laura Glory is moving up. This regatta is up for grabs. What do you think of all these superstars from around the country coming here to sail these cows? I think it's unbelievable. I think we're really fortunate. Great for the fleet and uh, just having all these superstars, you know, going down the line and seeing guys like Gary Jobson and Paul Kayard and all these people out there saying we're going to them versus Harry Malgus or Andy Burdick. It's a little different. We see those guys every day. So really good for the fleet and really uh, feel fortunate. So everybody will become an ambassador for these cows. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> so how's it going? Uh, we're in third place. So it's pretty good, and you know we got a shot. Bora's out there quite a ways, so I don't think we'll get there, but uh, it's fun.
One of the greatest American sailors of all time is Buddy Melgas from Zenda, Wisconsin. At the age of 85, he watches the blue chip with great interest. Well, Buddy, it's hard to believe 50 years of blue chips have gone by. What's your thoughts? Well, it's a great event for the uh, scow sailors to show their wares and their abilities and stuff like that. And this year is special because it's bringing in all the uh, past guests, uh, mystery guests, and putting them all together to find out who was the best mystery guest. So if you were to give some advice to somebody that came here, a mystery guest for the first time, what would you say to them to help them win in the, as a mystery guest? Well, I would say that you would have to, first of all, find out that uh, what the boat likes. And it, uh, scow is so simple to figure that out. And I use it to take across my uh, myriad of, of boats that I've sailed successfully, what, angle a heel. And, and with a scow, you wet the rail. You don't put any water on the deck. If it blows, keep the water off the deck, but down the wind, you can have an inch of water up on the deck and you're quicklier. More quicklier? More quicklier. That's in the English language. Yes, sir. <laughs> but of all the sailing you've done over the years, the scows, big boats, little boats, America's Cup, what stands out the most in your mind? Well, I think all the fun we have, and uh, it's, it's low key in a sense, it's very fierce when you're on the race course, but it's, uh, you get into the, you know, the the, uh, uh, the the happiness of of sailing and meeting these guys. And of course, everybody now, you know, they, I don't think, you, you, don't, you don't want to talk about being last in this race. You want to talk about being 24th. <laughs> yeah, well, everybody's good here. Yeah, absolutely. What does it mean to Pewaukee Yacht Club and to the scout class to have all these superstars from around the country, from around the world, come to the Blue Chip? Well, I think it, it, it enhances not only Pewaukee Yacht Club, but our Inland Lake uh, Yachting Association and the fun that we do have on the lakes, uh, the, the ability to uh, present the boat from Mother Nature before she ever gets on the boat. Uh, instrumentation is, is uh, non-existent virtually. I think what you have to do is put your mind out in front of the boat 100, 200, 300, if you can get out a quarter of a mile or a half a mile and be patient with that. That's the way to sail the lakes. A lot of people are surprised how good the sailing is here in the Midwest. Well, it is because you're pitting yourself against Mother Nature all the time. I mean, here, uh, Cam Lewis rounded the windward mark second to last. And what was he at the bottom mark? Right in the middle of the fleet. And uh, I mean, you know, here, these are guys are great, won world championships and international stuff. And, and gosh, uh, you know, it's fun to sit here and watch them all perform and then see what Lake Geneva and Lake Pewaukee and the Midwest does to their sailing techniques. The boats line up for the start of race three in strong winds. Everyone is pushing hard to be right up on the line. Several boats appear to be over the line at the gun. They'll have to go back and start properly. Liz Bayless and her crew are in disturbed wind and talk over their strategy to try to get clear. Will they sail? We got tack here, ready? Tacking, three, two, one. Ducking, ducking these guys. Watching Cam Lewis, you can see how athletic one has to be to steer these boats. Lots of emotions out here on the race course. Dave Ullman has been working as coach with the American team preparing for the upcoming Olympics. It takes a totally different mental makeup. Uh, and it took me a little while. I've been coaching uh, Annie and Bree in the 470s, women's. And it took me a couple, a couple regattas to get in the right frame of mind. It's, um, you have to be very positive all the time and very constructive and never upset. And it's, it's different than racing yourself. Two, three, two, one, let's go. Cam Lewis sailing M35 on the right, tacks underneath Dave Ullman on the left. The wind continues to build. It's now blowing over 20 miles per hour. The e is a unique design. 
These boats sail best in smooth waters. Peter Holmberg is used to bigger waves, but likes these boats. Flat bottom, square bowed phenomenon. Obviously, the ancestors weren't dumb. They figured out something pretty clever, you know? So, uh, flat bottom boat, got to sail it. I find it a lot like a catamaran. I sailed the beach cats when I was young and had a few hours in them, and I find it a lot like that. The design of the East Gow evolved beginning in the late 1800s for racing in the Midwest and Long Island Sound. Along with many others, famous America's Cup builder Nathaniel Harrisoff was commissioned to design scow-like boats for single-purpose regattas. The Inland Lake Yachting Association introduced the One Design e-scow class for racing in 1925. The speedy boat was popular with spectators. These historic film clips of the e-scow are from the 1940 Macmillan Cup, a regatta for college sailors hosted on Barnegat Bay. Sam Merrick was the regatta chairman, along with his friend, Runyon Coley. Both would excel in the e-scout class over the years. The forward sail is a triangular sail for reaching, giving the boat extra speed. B2 was Sam Merrick's boat. The owners of these boats on Barnicot Bay provided the boats to these collegiate sailors, none of whom had ever sailed an e-scout before. No doubt, they enjoyed their speed. In the end, Williams College was the champion. The McMillan Cup was established in 1928 by legendary Briggs Cunningham. This 28-foot long boat continued to evolve over the decades. You can't be focused on just the front end of the boat. You know, you have to be looking out away from the boat, see what's going on. As I said, the wind is shifty, things happen fast, and it makes you sail, you know, external motive, external vision kind of and into you got to keep shifting between in into the boat and out of the boat and back into the boat again how athletic are these boats well they're pretty athletic especially when the wind blows you know i asked some of the guys that are sailing in the front I, i've crewed for these boats you crewed for these boats you know you got to make a lot of things happen and you can be pretty sore at the end of the day i go right across this bow we'll cross we'll cross and now we're tacking we're tacking we're tacking nothing talking. like being decisive as a past Mr. Guest, I too got to sail one of the East Gals. I grew up sailing these boats on Barnicot Bay, New Jersey in the 1960s. Well up ahead, Bora Galari leads the third race. Paul Kayard and John Lovell are close behind. We'll be back in a moment for the conclusion of race three. How have these boats changed over the years? Upwind, not so much. The rigging has changed. Uh, you don't have backstays anymore, but uh, by the time I was sailing, I'd taken the backstays off. So upwind, it's not, uh, not a big deal. It's pretty much the same stuff. Uh, downwind, it's a whole new game. Really cool. Really, really cool. I'm looking out there just thinking about uh, the angles and, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's a whole new game. You sail a lot hotter, uh, a lot faster, and uh, the closing distances are ridiculous. You know? Do you think this class will continue to evolve over the next 10, 20, maybe even 50 years? Well, you brought up last night about foiling, and, you know, everybody laughed. You know, good joke, Gary, good joke. I wouldn't be surprised, but uh, there's no question that uh, it'll continue to evolve, and it'll continue to be one of the premier classes in the, uh, in the world. Welcome back to the conclusion of race three of the 50th Blue Chip Regatta from Pewaukee, Wisconsin. Bora Galari continues to lead the race. He's got a comfortable lead over Cam Lewis and Paul Van Cleve. Next step to set the spinnaker and accelerate. Head down, head down, head down. Going down, going down, going down. With the spinnaker up, the boat takes off. Okay, where's the puff? Get the heck out of here, boys. Keep in mind, these skippers have never raced with these crews before. I think this is really uh, one of the special events in sailing for, you know, for this whole decade. You know, really bringing together the top American sailors of our generation. That's kind of how it feels like to me. And, uh, you know, to be included among that group is a real honor for me. 
very cool to see all these superstars from around the country here. Yeah, superstars and just great people too. You know, I'm really um, reminded not just what good of sailors they are, but also what nice people and how many of them are, have given back to the sport and continue to do so. So, Jonathan, I, you know, I look back at your long career and uh, winning the gold with Carl and uh, later winning with your brother, Charlie. What, what was the secret to your success of doing so well in Olympic competition? I, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I th each situation is, is different, and I think for in both of those campaigns, um, we just managed to come right at the right time. We managed to win uh, difficult selection trials in both cases. And then, I, you know, I guess we prepared well and had good coaching at the games and managed to keep our heads and uh, <laughs> not screw it up. BH-8 Bora Galari Sailing Shimmer closes in on the finish. There's a good sized spectator fleet out here. I think they're looking for any secrets that can be gleaned from the racers. Cam Lewis finishes in fourth place, a big improvement over his 15th and 11th. All right, nice race, guys. We were up in a solid second for a while and uh, had a bad drop at the bottom mark and ended up fourth, but I'm happy to be in the top five. Borg Glory has a nine point lead, but only five points separate the next five boats. After racing, I serve as moderator for a panel discussion with several members of the National Sailing Hall of Fame. So, four Hall of Famers here. My hero of heroes, Buddy Melgas. <laughs> Buddy Melgas, America's Cup champion, was 62 years old, oldest helmsman by far to win the America's Cup. Gold medalist in the Olympics, bronze medal Olympics, umpty umpty scout championship as a crew and a skipper. But more importantly, he's done more to help lots of people over the years become better at sailing. And Buddy is truly an iconic American hero. Wouldn't you agree? I was a dinghy sailor. I had been beaten up by Buddy Melgis in the starboat. And I was trying to learn from my buddy Blackaller. And every we were going slow, and we were tacking all the time. And you know, life was about inches and seconds. And I applied that mentality to the Whitbread Round the World race. And eventually, it came good. But I almost killed everybody on the boat on the second leg because I had that mentality of. Well, if you can carry the big kite in the daytime in 40 knots, why couldn't you carry it in 40 knots in a snowstorm at 2 a.m. on the 10th night? My lesson was, you know, in all the things that I've been able to achieve, okay, we make mistakes along the way, but you learn from the mistakes, you move forward, and you enjoy the people and the sport and the game and the chess part of it. And, you know, don't think you're ever gonna, you're gonna win every race. But as long as you can come back at the end of the day and you like the people you're sailing with and you appreciate what the guys that you're sailing against are doing, that's the trick behind it all. And that's what you're going to be doing forever. The one thing about sailing on the lakes, you've got to know the ladies. And when they open their windows and things like that, because they have an apparent effect on the shifting of the wind. So. It's very, you come to Lake Geneva, I know all those ladies on the South Shore, you're post. Buddy, you're still my hero. A standing ovation for Buddy and the other Hall of Famers. Two races to go. Can Borgawari hold on? All of us on the stage have had a wide variety of, of sailing experiences over the years. I can assure you, all of us have lost a lot more races than we've won, but occasionally we did win. And what we'd like to do is pass the torch over to you. Are you the recipient here? Yeah. Come on up here. Uh, you're the you're representative. I got the word, tall and blonde. Yeah. <laughs> you qualify. Anyway, we'd like to pass that on and see where you all are in 50 years. Thank you very much. For race number four of the 50th East Scout Blue Chip Regatta, we joined two Olympic medalists aboard these enduring and speedy boats. Cut it, full speed.
Cram. Cram. Ready to come up. Use your jib of hair. Nice one. Careful of my heel. You guys are monitoring it. Nice one, guys. Talk to me speed and height with this guy. You're higher and faster. The guy right off your hip. You're equal with the guy up right above you. Thank you. Gonna get a little pressure here. Hang in there. Make sure the jib's trim, guys. Here comes pressure. Yeah. Here comes header pressure tacking. No. I struggled a little bit to get used to the e-scows, but then we won our last race back in 86. So I'm trying to get back in form again now. 29 years later. It's, that's right. We did a little warm up in Charleston and the boats are just fantastic. Really enjoying them. So you've been sailing keel boats an awful lot this year. So shifting gears from a heavy keel boat to a light, light uh, dinghy here is big change. It sure is. The keel boats we're sailing are mostly the Karkeek 40 and the TP 52. And those you have to sail pretty hot downwind with asymmetric spinnaker. So a little bit of similarity there. On the other hand, we've uh, putting a lot of time in the etchels and that's completely different with a pole and go dead downwind. H7, Graham Landy on the left, crosses ahead of Cam Lewis aboard M35 on the right. The skippers look for more wind along the north shore of Pewaukee Lake. The conversation while racing is focused, relaxed, and businesslike. Veteran East Scout sailor Dick White sets his spinnaker. White won this event in 2007 and has a seventh, fifth, and eighth so far. The boat accelerates with the spinnaker set. The wind drops as the fleet converges on the windward turning mark. Peter Holmberg is in second at this point in the race. A little bit of hike, getting better here, a little hike. Thank you, nice. Jib on, we're gonna try and beat this guy around, nice. A little ease on your jib, make it a little bit forgiving. Ease your jib a little more, look at it. Thank you, nice. Two, one. I'm just gonna cleat this, I think, this time. Okay, Susan, I'm just gonna cleat it. Hold. Hang on, hold on. Three. Holmberg says learning to sail in the Virgin Islands helped him develop as a sailor. We keep producing some real uh, good sailors. A, we're blessed with the weather, you know, good sailing 24 7. Hey. Second thing I'd say is our little yacht club in the little corner of the island is the perfect setting for learning and growing your skills. And then just with our, uh, you know, our peers, my fathers and those that set the bar high, we all keep expecting more of our kids. Dick White leads approaching the leeward gate. Crew member Chris Jewett is on board and likes sailing with White. Been sailing e-boats for a long time, a scow sailor, and uh, we're able to sail with uh, Dickie White on the back of our boat. How have you seen the e-scout class evolve over the years? You know, we had the, we changed the asymmetrical a few years ago. Uh, I think it was a, a great deal or a great difference for the fleet. But it's just been consistent. I mean, I've been doing it for 20 years and sailing and fourthing for Billy Allen at an inland winning that on Lake, uh, Lake Oshkosh there. And uh, it's just been a, a constant growth and everybody doing it's fun, so it's, uh, it's good. More heel, more heel, lean it over. Standing by, three, two, one, go for it. Go Halyard, Halyard, Halyard. Go all you can. Halyard down, Halyard down. Coming up in two, one, turn it up. Nice job. Diving. And you're deep room here. Gordy Bowers maneuvers in the foreground. He's been racing these boats for over 50 years. Impressive. The speed of the boats is what everybody that has ever sailed a scow thinks is great about these boats, you know. And the water's a little flatter in general for our inland lakes, and the boats are fast, the wind shifts a lot, and the combination of a lot of shifts and 
the speed, you're never out of a race, and that's a, that's a big thing that I think appeals to a lot of people racing these boats. Bowers finishes second in a third race. He's one of the most experienced East Scow sailors of all time. There's a lot of traffic around the marks, and yet there are a few penalties. Jibbies, follow the jib. Follow the jib. Steve Benjamin is a versatile sailor who is still active at 60. His Olympic medal was a long road. Come on, guys, your windward sheet. Windward sheet is tight. Okay. It would really be the Olympics would, would have to be the number one. You know, we were on the team for 1980, and then our government uh, with Jimmy Carter decided to boycott the games, and uh, that meant four more years for me. And I was lucky at that time that I could do four more years. So we trained really hard to 84, and uh, we won the trials narrowly over Dave Ullman, who's here, and we were in shape to win the gold. And with an over early in race number five, uh, we got knocked back sort of to fourth, which you don't want to be in the Olympics. So we worked real hard and pulled it up to a silver. Ready, two, one, here we go. Holmberg and boat M10 closes in on leader Dick White as they approach the finish. Windward board up. Come on, come on. White by a nose. Nice one, guys. <laughs> Good fight, eh? We made him sweat. That's the way, man. Glory leads by six points. We're ready for the blue chip dinner. <laughs> we have 23 full beef tenderloins. At 522, they are going on the grill. On Saturday night of the blue chip, over 350 sailors celebrated 50 years of sailing, honored past winners, and the mystery guest at a spirited dinner on Lake Pewaukee. Blue chip dinner, Saturday night. Got to look dapper. This is Bill Allen. Bill Allen has won more blue chips than any other single person. And I think you have between first, second, third, how many do you have there? I mean like 20. 25. 25, so half. 50 regattas, half of them has been in the top three, which is unbelievable. Ahoy, matches! Coming up, the final race of the 50th blue chip. So looking back on your career, a lot of scout sailing, but you had a big event in 1972. Is well, that the pinnacle? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I always say that that's certainly a sailing pinnacle. Uh, there were there were a couple of, of them, which included winning all the races at the Blue Chip here one year, which I know got done last year, but you know it had been since about '84, and it had never been done uh, really. To, with that kind of a, uh, of a group, you know how good they all are, and uh, you know no corners or anything. So it really is. That was a pinnacle. But the Olympics was totally different. I mean, we 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 worked so well together. We we only really did three or four regattas a year. And, but when you sail with Buddy, at least my experience is it's. It's going to be a great time, and, and you're going to win. Gary, I always say that I sailed three years with Buddy, and every regatta we went to, I never had to buy a drink because someone was always buying us a drink in the bar. And they usually had a tie and a sport coat on, and we only sailed one race a day. You know, nice. Very civilized. You remember that stuff. Now they want to sail four. Ugh. So... Yeah, that was a pinnacle. And I met my wife on the way to the Olympics and spent some time with her there. So uh, it, was, it was big. 24 boats line up for the fifth and final race of the East Gow Blue Chip. The competitors have a new challenge with little wind. Wait up, wait up, wait up. John Lovell tries to accelerate as the seconds count down to the gun. Peter Holmberg sailing ballistic in the foreground has a strong windward position coming off the line just as the wind starts to build. However, the wind has not reached Peter Fortenborough further down the line. The view from the opposite side of the course shows how close the boats are. 
Mark Reynolds is aboard boat M8. Do not ease jib. Do not ease jib. He's a longtime star sailor. It's an exciting boat. I mean, you have to really be in the in the breeze, you know, watch for the puffs. And uh, uh, it's a little hard in a boat like this where you have to sit down to the leeward side. Uh, um, I, I, when I sailed here before, I sailed with Harry Melgas, and I think Harry was a little frustrated that I wasn't staying in the breeze, and that's kind of what's happening this week, too. You know, as you look back on your uh, immensely successful career in the Starboat, what do you think it was that set you apart from so many other star sailors to win the two golds, the silver, two world championships, and a pile of other stuff? Well, I had a pretty good start coming from San Diego with guys like Lowell North and Malin Burnham and Jerry Driscoll, Dennis Connor. And, and I focused on the star. A lot of the other guys that I sailed against, guys like Kostecki and Kayard and Brune and uh, Adams, they did other stuff where I pretty much just really kept sailing the star all the time. John Lovell dips behind right of way Paul Kayard in B511. Uh, There's a lot of traffic here. Lovell does have some experience in these kind of boats. My wife grew up sailing scows in Lake Minnetonka, so it kind of all worked out. And uh, I've always liked the boats, neat boats, and get to sail them every now and then. So, so you've had some ups and downs here. Yeah, yeah, we've uh, looked like a hero a couple times and uh, flipped over on one race and got a DNF that didn't really help the overall scores. But uh, we're having a blast, so can't complain. Round the world race winner Paul Kayard sailing V511 is having a good regatta. He's got considerable respect for his peers. It's a collection of uh, a lot of great sailors and apart from the tough competition it's been a lot of fun just catching up with people that I've known on the 1984 Olympic team or 1983 America's Cup or you know events from a long time so it's it's a great group. Chris, you're noted for going on long distance ocean races and racing in salt water. What's it like here on the lake? It's tricky. Very shifty, very tricky. Um, it's never over till it's over. Um, but the fresh water's nice. Fresh water is nice. Lovell tries to recover from his slow start. His crew has a good spinnaker set and they accelerate. Just to windward, a rival, Peter Fortinball, drops their spinnaker in the water, and the boat comes to a stop. Well, the crew recovers after losing a few lengths. They're not alone. Some other boats are having trouble with their spinnakers. Fatigue, maybe? Dave Perry, with the Don Quixote graphic on the sail, has a near spill. He's one of the world's authorities on the racing rules of sailing. I'm glad I don't play tennis, because the court's always the same size, basketball, the hoop's always the same. You know, sailing everywhere is different, and everywhere's got their thing. And think of all the great lake sailors that have done well in the sport of sailing, and the reason is it just never stays the same out there. And it's just changing, and it's, it's hard, and it's, it's, you got to be on your toes, and, you know, and it's fresh water. I like that, too. So I like it all. As we watch the crews shift gears by setting and taking down sails around the turning marks, many of the local scow sailors will remember the experience of racing with some of the most successful American sailors. There are many lessons that can be learned by everyone on the race course. That is one of the great things about this sport. You never really master it. You just keep trying to get better. Of course, many lessons have to be relearned. Two-time Olympian J.J. Fetter has certainly learned from her early sailing days. I was last in the youth champs when I was a kid <laughs> um, in Milwaukee. And uh, so, you know, my feeling is if you just, you got to stick with it and you almost learn more from the races that you don't do well. And so, you know, when you have a bad day, you think, okay, well, that just gave me a lot of stuff to learn. You having fun? Having a great time, yeah. There we go. Paul Caird is philosophical about the aggression he sees out on the water. I think the fun thing is to see who's got the intensity still. Some people are still just as intense as they were 30 years ago, and others have relaxed a little bit. And um, that's 
kind of one of the first things I noted at the first cocktail party on Wednesday night. You know, people were, I think Dave Ullman showed up here on Monday to train all week, you know, so just to give you an idea. Up ahead on the far right of this screen, Paul Kayard wins the race. One of his crew is only 14 years old. What a great experience for him. Nice. Not far behind, Holmberg and M10 and Gordy Bowers and CR66 close with leader Bora Galari and BH8. It's tight. Bora Galari outlasts Holmberg. Dick White is third and Paul Kayard fourth. Worked out pretty well. What was the secret to winning? These three guys, that's for sure. <laughs> really, how did Bora do? It was amazing. It's just it's so nice to sail on such a quiet boat. And working with Carl and Bora and then Ryan on the jib, it was a pleasure. I'm just so lucky to be riding with these guys. Bora Galari and his happy crew. Next up for Bora is trying to reach the Olympics. The concept of a lightweight, fast boat that could skim over the waves has intrigued sailors for over 100 years. After racing under a handicap time allowance for 40 years, measurement standards were adopted in 1925 to make the eScal a one design class. As new technology, materials, rigs, and sails, along with advanced sailing techniques, have evolved over the decades, the sailors in the class had the courage to upgrade their boats periodically. The goal has always been to sail faster. By including the mystery guest at the Blue Chip, they have encouraged the world's best sailors to become ambassadors. Being invited is a treasured feather in every sailor's cap. The East Scout and the Blue Chip can look forward to another 50 years of excellence on the water. I'm confident that the East Scout class will thrive many decades into the future. I'm Gary Jobson.